So with that in mind, it looks like it's time is, uh, yes. Uh, so with that, uh, the propaganda and political communication issue, Dr. Emma Bryant, senior lecturer at the University of Essex, will be enlightening us uh, on the issue of propaganda and political communication. Uh, again, let's give her a big welcome. Am I visible? Hi. Can people hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Hi there, everyone. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's wonderful to be able to address you all at this really important conference. Um, uh, thank you to uh, Jim Soper as well as everybody else for having me here. Um, I wish I could really be there in person, but it, it sounds like a really interesting lineup that you've got ahead of you. Um, uh, as per my introduction, uh, my name's Dr. Emma Bryant, and I'm a senior lecturer uh, or uh, associate professor uh, from the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Uh, and my specialism is propaganda research and the media. Um, and uh, I have two books. Um, oh, hang on a second, my slides aren't working. There we go. I have two books, um, one called Bad News for Refugees, another called Propaganda and Counterterrorism Strategies for Global Change. Um, and I've just come back from the United States uh, where I've been researching for the last year at George Washington University for a new book called What's Wrong with the Democrats? Media Bias, Inequality and the Rise of Donald Trump. Uh, which is co-authored with Professor Robert Entman there. And I'm going to be drawing a little bit on some of our findings um, so far from the uh, recent election research. Um, many of you are, of course, uh, very concerned about the recent debates about fake news. And you're, of course, right to be. Um, but it's, of course, just one element of a wider, long-standing and very old problem of propaganda, which uh, is aimed at concentrating power and wealth in fewer and fewer hands. This is something that has obviously been around for a very long time, but we've seen uh, a very, very different uh, forms emerging in recent years. Fake news... Uh, is also accompanied, of course, by efforts to push out partial ideological selective information uh, and disproportionate emphasis on some perspectives over others, as well as dysfunctions within our media system and the market pressures that have been around for a long time uh, that have been getting worse and worse with the rise of the Internet uh, and uh, distorting our um, already biased profit-oriented media system. Uh, the recent problems have fed off um, a long-standing issue with uh, concentrations of ownership, which results in a very poor, skewed range of debate and mainstream media bias towards the coastal elites uh, and, of course, towards free market economics as well. The latter has aided Republicans and centrism within the Democrats. Um, and although... Um, Democrats have aimed to address inequality, it's made it very, very difficult to really adequately challenge a consensus um, that assumes that it's necessary to narrow debate around the middle uh, in order to win over voters. Um, in fact, if we look at the recent election, actually um, everything has confounded those kinds of assumptions. And um, the recent campaigns have really uh, shaken up all of our previous um, assumed beliefs uh, within the field of political communication. Um, we've seen over the last 10 to 15 years a declining trust uh, among the United States public um, in the mainstream media. Um, so this has been going on for quite a long time, and this problem uh, is very much exploiting the, um, the issues that uh, have, have um, become really, really very rigid and difficult to deal with. Um, new technologies have, of course, emerged that are allowing anybody seeking to influence um, uh, populations to mon monopolize highly segmented audiences with uh, invisible micro-targeting um, of advertisements um, on Twitter and Facebook and all the other um, social media as well as um, uh, co coordinating that uh, more broadly with their campaigns. Um, and this allows um, 
this sort of very focused targeting allows lies to spread mm. and not mm. really be countered. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how that's happening. Um, in the 2016 election, uh, we saw an awful lot of um, uh, conservative fake news, more than liberal fake news. So it's about a third, uh, a third more uh, coming from conserv conservative um, sources than from liberal sources. Um, however, it is a problem that affects both. Um, uh, our early data um, from our particular book is also indicating that Clinton was being accused of uh, some some form of uh, economic elitism um, 27 times more than uh, Trump. Now, of course, both parties have their elite uh, and um, there are, you know, very reasonable criticisms, perhaps, to say that, you know, uh, Clinton maybe does have some elite orientation. However, um, this kind of massive imbalance uh, was being fed uh, by the um, by a rising um, media nexus on the right, uh, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, which has really very much imbalanced the American media system. Um, we've seen uh, a reshuffle of the U.S. Uh, right-wing elite over the recent years. And um, it's important to emphasize that the new uh, Republican elite and old Republican elite um, have an alignment of economic interest that is pretty similar, really. Um, we've seen new faces emerge and vie for power and win dominance. And um, they've built on... Um, pre-established uh, pre um, media foundations that were built on the right with the with Fox News and the um, uh, radio um, talk shows and so on, um, but have ha and used this kind of foundation to build a really very strong and um, significant media nexus on the right, very far right. Um, new names we've seen rise are Robert and Rebecca Mercer. So Robert Mercer is a hedge fund millionaire who you might have seen in the papers, uh, and he's Trump's biggest donor. Um, so he gave 45 million to Republican campaigns, including Ted Cruz. Um, he's also friends, of course, with Steve Bannon and Kellyanne Conway. And also, interestingly, Nigel Farage, uh, who was the former leader of uh, the UK Independence Party, uh, who were campaigning for Brexit and uh, in the United Kingdom. And um, uh, he was uh, the, also the figurehead of the Leave.eu campaign, uh, which was um, the very much more extreme um, campaign for for leaving the, the e European Union. Um, and, uh, and a really very, very racist campaign. Um, the Mercers funded the new right-wing media nexus, which I'll show you an image for, uh, in the United States. And it, this was really very much propelled um, in three different ways. Um, so they uh, gave donations of $10 million to uh, the Media Research Center, which sounds very innocuous, but it's actually a very biased uh, research unit, which um, basically seeks to expose liberal bias um, and uh, it's, it's really just a campaigning front um, to uh, attack the mainstream media for uh, for the right. Um, also, he gave $10 million to Cambridge Analytica to help them in their campaign uh, to, um, to raise the profile of Breitbart um, and uh, propel Trump to power. Um, they also gave 10 million to Breitbart to establish that and build it into a very strong ideological um, propaganda organization. Um, and they now are um, paying for all of Trump's legal bills in the challenges that he's facing um, and investigations into um, possible collusion and so forth with the um, uh, with the. Um, inquiries into Russia and so on. Um, now, um, obviously, you'll be very familiar with the Koch brothers. Um, initially, uh, they were uncertain about these new rising um, uh, elements of the right-wing elite um, and almost hostile to them. Uh, but 
as we've seen, they've actually kind of more fallen in line with that, um, uh, with this kind of rising and resettling of the of the right wing elite. And um, as tr Trump gained power, they've aligned to them uh, aligned themselves with the winners. Um, uh, researchers from Harvard have patterned and mapped out this nexus. So I want to share with you a couple of slides which show the um, the right wing media nexus that has been developed on on Twitter. So you can see the red on the right, um, the right wing media nexus itself, all um, huddled around Breitbart, which is the big big red blob. And then you've got the mainstream media, uh, which is the blue and the green in the center there. Um, now, um, uh, the, these researchers have shown the effect of what very different political campaigning uh, measures have, have done, uh, ver the very different effect that they've had during this election. It's not just technology alone, though, that's determining how the campaign polarized uh, into echo chambers. Uh, but how it was actually used in practice. And it's really, really important to point out that it's not just about the technologies, it's about what's being amplified in these cases. Um, the new techniques are being called computational propaganda, and I'm going to explain a little bit about that. Um, you would argue that, um, we, we, we would argue in our book, uh, that this kind of evidence uh, demonstrates that the Democrats have a failing very traditional strategy uh, for communicating and um, have made myriad failures, really, honestly, very bad. Um, and uh, the emerging new Republican strategy has sought to monopolize and isolate different parts of the American public and their audiences around very extreme right wing uh, media nexus. So this you can see on the right. And it's very, very segmented and very clustered and not very much uh, connected to any other media. So um, a third of pro-Trump tweets were actually generated by bots and highly automated accounts, enabling strong levels of activity to sort of cluster around these little blobs that you can see, these nodes that are really very isolated. The um, Facebook, you can see, is similarly isolated from, from the mainstream. Uh, and the US media scape has uh, therefore become very polarized, but not symmetrically. The far right is a dense, tightly linked um, ecosystem that has very little connectivity with the rest of the system, whereas the far left really is uh, integrated into the mainstream media dialogue. It's frequently attacked, in fact, and is much smaller in dimensions, you can see. Um, so uh, the insular nature of the far right's media makes it very difficult to debunk inaccurate claims because they sort of ricochet from site to site, providing reinforcement for their existing ideas and so on and claims, um, making it really difficult to sort of um, for, for the recipients of that information to then triangulate um, their way to the truth. Far right media is effective in inserting narratives into mainstream media as well. So um, it's really important to note that they are actually managing to hijack mainstream media and insert, uh, you know, uh, their agenda, uh, raise their agenda. Um, so um, it basically manages to um, bridge between uh, the sort of fringe conspiracy theories and mainstream political discourse. Breitbart is an especially effective tool for doing that. Um, but much of the blame can actually be put onto organizations like the New York Times, uh, who report on and therefore amplify a lot of this uh, extreme and very un unverifiable information. It makes it seem like it's a uh, it's it's all the way through our, you know, um, uh, understanding. It, it, it's all around us all the time, which makes it more significant and therefore me means that it's going to be more likely to get talked about. Um, and the bots play a really important part in that because what they aim to do is to uh, make a particular issue trend. And then, of course, the mainstream media needs to talk about it uh, or feels it should. So, uh, What's wrong with Breitbart? Well, 
we even have to ask. So uh, it's clearly, it, it's really a, a very problematic um, uh, media organization that has been set up fairly recently. And it's a deliberate tool to channel uh, KKK and neo-Nazis and their sympathizers um, and try to make them more mainstream. Um, Breitbart and Infowars as well um, are currently subject to the FBI probe into Russian botnets. Um, their conspiracy theories and their extreme ideological content um, has really been uh, enabled through these kind of, not, not just the Russian botnets, but also through the um, computational propaganda um, during the, um, the Trump campaign to, um, to be amplified and then become uh, much more significant than it ever could have been before. Um, I'm going to show you a few, a little bit of um, early provisional data from our book. We've done a survey of U.S. public, uh, and we're still analyzing this. But mm -hmm. um, this is our very early findings, and they really do raise some concern. Um, we found that um, looking at trust in relation to Breitbart, we found that 35 percent of Republicans uh, we asked, and 20 percent of Democrats. Uh, said that they thought this was a trustworthy source. Now, we did give them an option to say, I don't know. Um, and th th I think this is very, very worrying data. Um, so I'm still trying to <laughs> get my head around. I was really shocked about this. Um, during my uh, during my research on propaganda during the war on terror, I interviewed several people working on uh, military psychological operations. Um, from the contractor SCL. Um, this is an offshoot of a company um, uh, that uh, gave birth to um, uh, Cambridge Analytica, um, the PR company which Trump and the Mercers hired uh, to do the social media campaign during the election. Um, so they developed their techniques during the war on terror on psychological operations targeting um, uh, foreign adversaries. So they use something called psychographic targeting uh, to target their audiences. Steve Bannon had a board on uh, uh, had a seat on the board of Cambridge Analytica before he became Trump's strategist, and there is some uh, in indication that they are so well funded that they've been doing work for free as strategic advisors, uh, planning in the um, early days of the Leave.EU Brexit campaign. Um, so there seems to be an awful lot of coordinational cooperation, or at least complementary provision. Um, from these two d different campaigns. Um, and if that is the case, which we're currently trying to prove this in the courts and so on, um, then it is highly significant that uh, this Anglo-American movement seems to have uh, managed to capture, um, you know, both our political systems um, and is trying to reshape, uh, you know, the entire Anglo-American um, uh, bloc. Uh, not to mention Europe. Um, so uh, these are really, really very uh, serious um, concerning issues. And the role of propaganda in enabling this is something that we really need to be uh, very, very careful in how we respond to. Um, so uh, what the hell is psychographic targeting and computational propaganda? Um, some of you might be feeling a little bit baffled at the moment. Um, basically, psychographic targeting um, is a method that was used by Cambridge Analytica to uh, monopolize audiences and control the information that was being put out to them to advantage Trump and to build new this new kind of mainstream, uh, uh, extreme right-wing uh, uh, network of media and separate them very much off from the uh, from the mainstream. Um, they used biased information and fake news, which was being spread by bots um, through botnets, and um, utilized people's private data um, uh, via Facebook and many other sources. It's not just through Facebook. Um, and one of the interviews that I did with somebody from uh, Cambridge Analytica, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, 
Ah, yes. How do I get out of this? Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I've interviewed people from Cambridge Analytica myself, and one of them told me that um, they have a database for all 240 million American voters uh, with more than 3,000 data points per person. So that's what they're able to, what that's what they know about all of you, all of the different data that they have on you. And what they do is they will run that through psychological uh, profiling and tests uh, to identify what your weaknesses are, what um, what points that make, make you emotional, and what can they manipulate. So um, they apply a particular psychological test to the data uh, called Ocean, uh, which uh, looks at openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And they target particular personality types. So neuroticism, uh, they would uh, target you with um, messages about immigrants swarming in and uh, destroying your culture, for instance. So they exploit our weaknesses, and they can run little tests and then refine uh, de depending on how you reacted to whatever they put out at you. Um, so what about Russia's role? Well, in recent years, um, we've seen that um, they seem to have targeted the swing states that Trump won, and they may have been further amplifying this data um, and these messages uh, and fake news through their bots. Um, it's uh, really important to to talk to just mention briefly. I know I'm coming up to the end of my time here, but um, Facebook has recently disclosed that 470 Russian accounts on on, on Facebook um, uh, and. Jonathan Albright, who is an academic at Columbia, has analyzed these, and um, he has found that the content from these sites, uh, which were posing as um, domestic organizations, so uh, United Muslims of America and so on, uh, it was shared 340 million times. That's just from six of the accounts. Um, from our data, we've actually looked at the trust given to uh, RT and uh, Russia Today in uh, in America. So we found that Democrats were, um, uh, in response to the question about how much they trust uh, RT, they said uh, 36 of them, 36 percent of them said that they trusted RT. Um, 21 percent of Republicans said that they trusted RT. I think both of those are very worrying. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to point out that uh, the threat of RT itself is often being exaggerated in the press. It's not a popular news source in the US, but um, this data is still very concerning. The most important point to remember about um, Russia's propaganda is that it's amplifying domestically produced propaganda on racial and religious divides. So it amplifies social turmoil and unrest created by social and economic inequalities that are already present in the United States. So the most important outcome of, of the, my presentation that I want you to take away is that we need to uh, address those, um, those issues in order to um, destroy the manipulators hold on our um, uh, on power. So um, I'm going to skip a couple of slides because I know I'm running low on time here. Um, it's very important to um, point to uh, how uh, we respond to these kinds of problems. The, it would be a real problem if the Democrats then came back with um, a similar method to, inc you know, exploit. Um, this kind of data through uh, computational propaganda. So what we really need to be doing is pressuring our policymakers to ensure controls on the use of private data for political campaigning. We need much more transparency and we need opt in, not opt out for kind of data sharing on Facebook and so on as a default. Uh, we also need to place regulatory control and decision making in the um, in, in the hands of uh, independent regulatory bodies, not putting it in the hands of profit-making companies that have actually exploited the data and um, to uh, the, the um, political use of data to actually um, make themselves rich. Um, and uh, we also have a personal responsibility among us as well. Um, I want to point out that there are some really great fact checkers that are available, um, which I would hope that you would share with friends if you see them posting anything that's fake, fake news and so on. Um, 
there are you know steps if you can see on the um the left of your screen um that you can follow when you're checking and wanting to know if something is real or not it's always think before you share um and it's really important to also note that there are new ideological fact checkers which are emerging uh which are sponsored by the far right and also by russia so it's important to uh know what fact checker you're using is is definitely reliable okay thank you very much i'm looking forward to your questions <laughs> thank you Okay, so we're asking people to line up uh, at the mic right there if you've got a question. All right, here's the first one. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what role do these same propaganda strategies play in Brexit? In Brexit, well, we're, we're currently trying to figure that out. <laughs> So there is an ongoing investigation, just like there is in the States into, um, you know, your, your recent elections, um, because it looks like um, what may have happened, um, it looks like that um, the, we, we have protections in place for our elections to stop people, um, uh, stop chewing too much funding going into one side of the elections. Um, now, uh, I highly recommend that in your case as well, by the way. <laughs> um, oh, but it sounds like what was provided by Cambridge Analytica may have breached those rules uh, which protect our elections. Um, so uh, they were, it, it seems they were giving help in the early days of the um, uh, Leave.eu uh, campaign, and they basically told uh, the... Um, Farage and um, his campaign team how to do psychographic targeting. There are a lot of people who are now denying this happened. However, I've spoken personally to people uh, who worked on the Leave.eu campaign as well as um, uh, on Trump's uh, campaign, and I, it, it happened. <laughs> they, they definitely did that. Um, how much help they gave is a matter of dispute. Um, and, you know, um, I think it's an issue of how much and when, because if it happened too late in that, in the stages, then, then they def definitely could be um, illegal activities. Um, basically, um, they, they were giving the help for free um, because they weren't allowed to pay for it, but it looks like that they also weren't allowed to give it for free because it's still a gift in kind, it's still, you know, swaying the election and they have to declare even, you know, services gifted, not just money. So it looks like they played a really important part. They were basically targeting very racist propaganda into um, the poorest communities, the people who really have um, actually benefited the most from uh, the EU's um, membership, um, because actually EU funds mostly went to those kinds of communities, um, and it's very, very, sh it's, it's absolutely awful. There were such lies, really, really bad. So uh, we're investigating at the moment, and I'm working with people to to try and investigate that myself. I can't say too much. <laughs> All right. Well, the time has expired for questions and answers. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a very good answer. And uh, the other question we have Thank to you. you was Carl Rove in your okay. uh, in your dwelling, knocking stuff around. If he was, say it now. Uh, well, we heard a little noise there. We were concerned. Emma. Uh, Emma, if it's okay for people to email your questions. Yeah. Absolutely. That would be great. I'd love to hear from anybody. And please check out the website. You can read a little bit more about the book on the Democrats there as well. <laughs> All right. Thank and, you, and, and what is your website? Right there. Okay. It's up there. I can't see it. Thank you very much, Dr.